Hello, everyone. So we meet again, although um, this is recorded and I don't get to see you, unfortunately. Uh, so today um, I'm just going to record a lecture on uh, proteins, food proteins, overview and trends. And then the next lecture that I will be recording will be talking about protein structure, linking it to functionality. So uh, basically understanding how to use protein ingredients in formulations and how different proteins from different sources impact functionality so that the pro producer can determine which protein ingredient needs to be used for which application. So to start off, I'll give you an overview of importance of of proteins in general and demand for protein and especially the demand on plant proteins right now and the trendy applications and the different protein ingredients that are conventional, that are present already in the market and those that are gaining tractions and those that are just starting to, be, to get into the market. Okay, so I'll try to make this about 50 minutes long and I will just pause in 50 minutes. So it's a kind of an actual lecture. It's unfortunate that we won't have an interaction. I love, as you know, questions and answers. So I've embedded questions in the lecture. You can, you know, pause in the recording and think about them before I give the answer. Um, just, just that you, you know, kind of try to be as engaged as possible with a recorded lecture. Alrighty, so uh, this is not news to any of you. Proteins are needed for nutritional uh, reasons. So protein quantity and quality is important. So in terms of quantity, we have to take about 50 grams of proteins per day, but it's important that that protein has essential amino acids that the body requires. And also this protein can be digestible. So when you look at an, um, the label, you'll see the amount of protein. But what's important is what does this amount tell us in terms of percent daily value? And this is estimated, the percent daily value is estimated based on a score of a protein. Sometimes one gram of protein is not completely absorbed and or digested, and it doesn't have all the needed uh, amino acids. So there are scores such as the PDCAS, Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score, that takes into account the first limiting amino acid score and how digestible the protein is. So if a protein like egg, milk, or whey, casein, other um, animal-based proteins tend to have a PDCAS of one, that means they're complete and 100% digestible. So 36 grams of any of these proteins is equivalent to 36 grams available. So that means 36 out of 50 represents 70%. But let's say you have a PDCAS of 0.8, such as in the case of rapeseed or canola. Canola is the genetic modification of rapeseed. So if you have a 0.8, that means if you have, let's say, 10 grams per serving, only eight grams are biologically available. Then you have to consider eight out of 50, not 10 out of 50 grams to get to your percent daily value. So we can see here, most of plant proteins are lagging behind animal-based protein with the exception of soy, which really has a complete kind of amino acid uh, score and it is digestible, so it has very close to one in terms of PDCAS. However, all of other um, all other plant proteins kind of lag behind soy. And if you look at wheat, for example, it's really pathetic over the 0.4 PDCAS. What else? So, of course, proteins are important for nutritional, but also they have physiological contributions. So muscle growth and regeneration. So if you're a muscle builder, you need to have to ingest high quality protein and a certain amount of that. And also, you, if you're an athlete after a game or a run or whatever your hardcore exercise, you need high protein a shake or bar or any high protein meal to regenerate the muscles. And usually you want that protein to be rich in um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, chained amino acids. So like um, 
leucine and isoleucine. Other benefits, uh, the proteins are encouraged for aging population because they prevent muscle deterioration. And also they help with weight loss, enhanced metabolic health in general. So they have good reputation, but I say that and I pause and I tell you everything in moderation is great. Excess protein intake can potentially lead to kidney issues. So let's just say proteins are good, have them in the diet, but again, think of things as in moderation. Another component of the protein that's very attractive is the bioactive peptides. So when the proteins are digested, whether outside of the body or in our digestive tract, sequences of the proteins will be released, like dipeptides, tripeptides, sometimes up to eight amino acids in a sequence can be directly absorbed into the, our system through the intestine and they have physiological contributions, such as reduction of hypertension, reduction of inflammation, being act as an antioxidant, antidepressant, promote satiety, so you name it. So because of that, proteins are added to a lot of different uh, products just for the nutritional and physiological benefits, not necessarily for taste or structure, like in, in let's say, uh, a bar, um, it doesn't really add to the taste, make it taste better, no. And it doesn't really add to the texture. On contrary, over storage, we get protein hardening due to protein, uh, well, bar hardening due to protein-protein interactions over time. So, but they're added to, so that we can put on the label high in protein or excellent source of protein. Um, same with um, kind of products such as Insure, for example. So, but proteins are also being used um, for other purposes. Um, they are um, not necessarily only for nutritional and physiological, but they have physical contribution to the, to the color and structure and texture of food. So, and flavor as well. So in terms of color, we all know that the um, cheese curd is white. Why? Because Kathy and my cells are light scattering. So we get that really nice white color of the curd. We have proteins that are chromophores, such as the myoglobin in meat and betalin in red beets. And proteins can also be, take part in uh, browning. Uh, which is desired, like in this bread, for example, we call this uh, non-enzymatic browning. This is your Maillard reaction, which you're familiar with from food chemistry. So it's a protein reacting with a reducing sugar, gives you that aroma and that color that is desirable in baked products. Enzymatic, so polyphenol oxidase is an enzyme and it's a protein, but it is not desirable in produce such as apples, for example. So if you know Granny Smith apple, for example, the side of the apple here, this is genetically modified to have lower levels of polyphenol oxidase so that when you cut the Granny Smith apple, it doesn't brown until a very long time. Uh, but sometimes the enzymatic browning is desirable, such as in um, tea. So when you get enzymatic browning in tea, that gives you that brown color that is desirable in that particular case. Flavor, what does protein taste like? I mean, I was listening to a student um, presentation, a PhD student, and he said that when he Googles proteins and then you put protein taste, or taste like, and then all the awful things come up. Taste horrible, taste bitter, taste um, bad. So, but the protein really itself doesn't have a, a aroma. It doesn't, there's no, it's not volatile. So there's no aroma associated with the protein itself. So because it, it has bad reputation because the source, so if it's coming from a legume, then it will have a beany flavor because of the beany flavor in legumes that are associated with the protein. But there are some tastes can be associated with the protein itself, not aroma, taste. So if we have high level of hydrophobic amino acids, and say if you hydrolyze a protein and you have segments that are very hydrophobic, they will be bitter. So you can taste the bitter. If you have segments that are high in acidic amino acid, you can feel some taste, some sourness. 
if you have high sulfur or sulfhydryl uh, containing amino acids like cysteine and also methionine, then you get that sulfur note, which mostly like egg proteins, for example. Monosodium glutamate is added for umami flavor, and it is really a, a glutamate, which is a glutamine amino acid linked to a sodium. It became the glutamate salt. It gives you that umami distinctive flavor. And when we hydrolyze, such as during ripening of cheese, you have the endogenous enzymes. They work on the proteins. Some enzymes work on the lipids as well. And then you get characteristic uh, peptides from the protein that gives you that very distinctive uh, flavor or taste of that cheese. Uh, sweetness, this is a dipeptide here, and I mean in two amino acids, you have aspartic acid and phenylalanine. Together it gives you aspartame, which is a sweetener. So in terms of physical function as well, it relating to, to texture and structure, proteins have so many attractive uh, functionalities. So first of all, if you want to produce a high protein beverage, such as this one here, for athletes, the protein has to be soluble, has to be soluble and also remain clear in solution. So this is a very important attribute. So we need to choose a protein ingredient that will be soluble at acidic pH, and we can incorporate high amount of it, and also um, and also is clear. Okay, so uh, other than solubility, water binding, gelation, so to have this jelly, if you look at this jelly, it's only 1% protein. So gelatin can really form a, a gel matrix, a three-dimensional uh, matrix at very low concentration. And then this is a tofu, for example, is also another form of gel. Yogurt is another form of gel. You have different types of gels that the proteins can form. Emulsifying and foaming, such as here in the um, ice cream, so the protein can emulsify the lipid and also can help incorporate air. So it acts as an emulsifying agent and a foaming agent at the same time. A viscosity, elasticity, this is very important in bread and baked products. Viscoelastic properties, for example, is very essential to form this nice loaf of bread. So that's very characteristic of gluten forming proteins. So what causes these types of textures and structure is really protein interacting with water or protein interacting with protein or protein interacting with carbohydrate or air or fat. So it's a matter of interaction with different components. And the interactions are via chemical bonding. So ionic hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic, covalent, which is mostly disulfide linkages, and thus forming these different structures. Interaction with water is important for um, beverage interaction with water and protein. Protein interaction is important for forming gel and so on. So all of these structures are formed based on interactions. So here's a table, which is a good FYI table to tell you where the functionality is important in which food systems. So beverage, we need solubility. You have meat and poultry products, cheeses, yogurts, remi, which is a cheese type, uh, sorry, a fish type of product. You need the water to be held. So three-dimensional holding of the water. So you form the matrix and the water is held within you. You don't get synthesis. Uh, gelation is also important in different types of products like tofu, um, gelatin, yogurt, scrambled eggs. So the ability of the protein to form a three-dimensional matrix. Emulsification, where is it important? Mayonnaise, uh, salad dressing, gravies, ice cream, and then foaming is important in whip, whip topping, creams, angel cake, and so on. So you get the idea. So every functionality is important for certain food application. And every protein ingredient we work with and I'll introduce have certain characteristics that has the producers uh, try to um, pick the ingredient or the protein ingredient based on the final functionality they would like in a particular application.
Okay, everything comes with a price. Proteins are great, but sometimes there are protein components that are anti-nutrient. So enzyme inhibitors are proteins. They are present in some plant materials. So for example, most common is trypsin inhibitor in soy. So soy products need to be heated to achieve at least 90% inhibition of that enzyme inhibitor. Otherwise, we can't digest our protein if we have enzyme inhibitor, such as trypsin. We have trypsin in our gut that digests protein. If you consume the inhibitor, then we have problems with digestion. Another one is alpha um, uh, amylase inhibitor, which is also cause digestion issues. Allergens. We have the big eight allergens. And the more we consume new types of protein, and all of a sudden they're incorporated in a lot of foods, and then we're not used to them culturally, like soy, for example, in North America. All of a sudden, 50 years ago, soy protein was introduced in a lot of products. So people got sensitized and some people developed allergies. So as of now, we have big eight allergens, and uh, these include dairy, the soy, the gluten, the um, nuts, tree nuts, peanuts and tree nuts, and, and, and shellfish and egg protein. So you have all of these under big eight. New proteins are emerging. Soon we might have big nine. We'll have to wait and see. Toxic components that might form based on reaction with amino acids, for example, if you have during the cured meat, you have nitrates, might cause nitrosoamines, or you might get heterocyclic amines from meat that is heated, um, cooked at really high temperature and burned. Uh, lectins can also be a, a, a type of protein that is found in seeds. So if we consume raw, raw beans, for example, we might get high amount of lectins that potentially cause some sort of inflammation in the gut. Others like Evidin, for example, is a protein in eggs. It can bind the, bind the vitamin biotin, rendering it not bioavailable. Histamine, another one uh, present in fish products that is a vasoactive amine. So, you know, everything has advantages and disadvantages, so we do have some anti-nutrients effects there. So let me shift and talk a little bit about the global protein demand, which is really, really hot topic right now. Everybody's interested in protein. Everybody wants more protein in their diet, and now also mostly plant protein here in, in the Europe and North America. So why do we have increased simply population growth. So there is a study that shows in 2030, there might not be enough protein to feed the population unless we do something to change our agriculture system. So socioeconomic changes, you know, when you have more income, more urbanization, you have more uh, population that are older, then the, the protein becomes a main component in their diet. And it's also associated with a healthy diet and healthy aging as well. So people are recognizing that. They're understanding the role of protein as a healthy component. So they're seeking more protein in the diet. If we look at developed countries versus developing country, in developing country, the increase in protein demand is mostly towards animal protein. But in developed countries, in Europe and North America, then uh, we have the need for alternative proteins that are mostly plant-based. So, but if we look at the global protein demand, uh, basically uh, for this growing population currently at 7.8 billion. So it really exceeds 200 million tons. So it's a great amount. And if we look at protein ingredients, so when I talk about protein in general, it can be eating meat, or milk, or a protein ingredient in a formulation. But if we look at the global demand for protein ingredients specifically, like whey protein, soy protein, pea protein, these ingredients, uh, including both plant and animal sources, this is expected to reach 7 million tons by 2025 in less than five years. And associated with that is, of course, the market revenue. It's also expected to reach $70 billion, a huge amount of, of dollars, obviously, by, again, the same year. And the rate of growth is at 8%. 8%. 
um, from a yearly from 20, excuse me, from 2014 to 2025. So, and that rate is actually is increasing. If I need to look at more recent data, I'll see that rate even higher than that. So if we look at the plant protein ingredients and specifically, we see about that it's representing about 40% of the global protein market or sector. So why, why is the interest in plant proteins, ingredients, and in general plant-based uh, foods? If we look at the consumers, they are growing to understand the uh, environmental effects. Um, now they're seeking something that is sustainable sources, something that protects our environment, produce less uh, gas, greenhouse gas. So they are understanding the, the need to protect the environment. Therefore, they're seeking alternative sources of protein that, is, that are produced under sustainable agriculture system. Animal welfare. They're concerned about the animal welfare. A lot of, uh, we see a lot of increase in vegetarians and flexitarians. Flexitarians are those people that would prefer to eat plant-based. They might have meat once in a while, but their preference on a menu is for vegetarian dishes. Um, and recognizing the association of healthy diet when, with the protein being high in that diet. And the rising incidence of allergenicity. So some people have gluten sensitivity or allergenicity, a dairy allergenicity. So they need other types of proteins to sustain their high protein diet. So they're looking for plant-based alternative. So, and if we think from a producer perspective, then they are realizing that the consumer is seeking um, new proteins. So they are themselves now seeking new protein ingredients, trying to understand how to incorporate them, how to profit from in including them to reduce their cost and also address consumer demand and find this place in the market that makes them special, better than others. And also try to address the clean label. You know, when you read, you look at your ingredients and you see a long list and what are these ingredients added for and why is it a long list and that you don't understand half of them. So the clean label is reduce the number of these ingredients on the label and use functional proteins to replace some chemicals. And not to forget, obviously, increased population growth. We need more protein. We need to find alternative protein to sustain the growing population. So if we look at the application right now that is trending and it is um, dominating the market in terms of plant-based are the meat analogs. They are just exploding. And there is, um, there is a projection that they would take up to one third of the market by 2050. So that's huge. But also we can't forget the protein beverages as well. They, these are also increasing. Uh, and there's a projection of the market growth to reach about 2 billion by 2025. So that's a huge market. You also hear about dairy alternatives. So we need to replace dairy milk with oat milk, almond milk, soy milk is still out there. And then plant-based cheeses. There's still a long way to go there with plant-based cheeses, given that the protein doesn't behave as casein would behave to form that nice texture of uh, the cheese, let alone melting on a pizza or a flavor that is beanie. So there are a lot of challenges yet, but this is a lot of research is going on in this area. Uh, protein bars and extruded products or so snacks with high protein in them, that's also another um, set of applications that are trendy. And consumers are looking for soy and gluten alternatives. So they are looking for um, alternatives to soy due to allergenicity and also kind of misinformation about soy and it, 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 its role on uh, in uh, estrogen, simulating estrogen in, in the body. So there's a lot of kind of, and also being GMO, so people looking for organic non-GMO uh, kind of sources and more than 90% of soy here in North America is GMO.
And then you have the gluten issue in terms of sensitivity, allergenicity, um, and celiac disease. And some people just misconception think that gluten is bad, so they avoid it for no particular reason, just misinformation altogether. So the consumers are looking for alternatives to these different common proteins, and, um, and the industry is seeking new protein ingredients. So here's just a pause. You can pause the video and just try to think in your head, what are the common protein ingredients out there? What are they used for? What do you know about new and emerging pro protein ingredients? What are some advantages and disadvantages? So I'm just going to, you can pause, just think about it, but then I'm just gonna move on and uh, quickly cover the common protein ingredients that you would find in the market. You have casein proteins like so sodium caseinate or micellar casein or uh, calcium caseinates. And there are whey proteins, whey protein isolate, whey protein concentrate. There is egg albumin, um, soy flour, soy protein concentrate and isolate. So the concentrate meaning you have uh, you concentrated the protein, so it's higher than in the flour. So if the flour is about 40 to 50% protein, then you'll concentrate 60 to 80% protein. And then you'll isolate it about 90. That's in the soy world, for example. And then you have the vital gluten that is used in applications such as meat alternative um, and to add, be added to baked goods as well. Um, meat protein, gelatin, my fiber protein, so of course have different applications. And we see also protein isolates concentrate, but we also see hydrolysate. So there's in the market whey protein hydrolysate. So it has been hydrolyzed a little bit to enhance functionality. We see soy protein hydrolysate in the market as well. So lots of options that are common uh, proteins in, in the market. Now, in terms of alternative proteins that are gaining traction, pulses, big now in the market, especially peas, is just growing drastically in the market. And behind it is chickpeas is getting up there as well, chickpea protein. And then you have the lentils and the beans are starting also to get attention, like mung beans, for example, and they're used for in uh, alternatives. Um, oil seeds, so such as soy in the past, you know, soy was used for oil, industrial oil even. So when they extract the oil, they figured out that there's this meal that is left is high in protein and fiber. So, and they found out that the protein is very nutritious. And then they thought, okay, we should have it as a food, for food application. And then they developed uh, the protein, soy protein ingredient business. So same is happening right now with canola or rapeseed in Europe. Uh, the canola is the Canadian genetically modified uh, crop. So again, canola oil, and then you have the meal, it's still nutritious and has high protein. And BSM company is going to launch a, a protein ingredient from canola, either in the summer of 2021, if I'm not mistaken, or 2022, so very soon. Sunflower protein in Europe is gaining traction. And then we have right now in, at the University of Minnesota, we're trying to develop new crops um, that are oil seeds that have environmental benefits that will benefit the environment, can be grown sustainably, and also are high in protein, such as camelina and pennycrest. Other uh, proteins you hear about is, is the single cell proteins from yeast, from algae, from fungus. You have also the lab grown, the cell cultured uh, protein, meat-like proteins in, grown in the lab, insect protein. And then you have a whole list of other plant sources of proteins. Potato in Europe, potato protein is popular. Oats is gaining traction in North America. Hemp right now is also being uh, studied. Corn, almonds, all sorts of nuts. We get we get a request to study African nuts for their protein content potential production of protein ingredient. So we get to study leaves are sent our way, 
to also look at alfalfa and a lot, a lot of different sources. I mean, you name it, everybody now into the business of protein and trying to get protein ingredients out of everything. Even out of air, there's air protein. If you haven't heard about it, look it up. Okay, so peas, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about peas because it's a trendy source. It is really uh, getting a lot of traction and it's being, it's replacing soy protein in a lot of application. Why pea? Because it's really easy to grow and it's a legume. So it fixes nitrogen in the soil. It is short season, so it can be actually planted in crop rotations. So it's easily available as a crop, basically, and it has good reputation in terms of sustainability. It's not GMO. And as of now, it's not one of the big eight or big nine allergens. But again, I say that you know, with caution, because with more pea protein thrown in a lot of application, you're bound to have a sensitivity to it by some segment of the population. And not to forget cross-reactivity because it's a legume, it's related to soy, it's related to peanut, you might get some cross-reactivity in allergenicity. But as of now on the label, you don't have to claim it as an allergen. So that's why it is attractive. So, and it is gaining traction. This is a little bit old. I need to update my chart. But if we look at percent of protein product launches, it's still, it's still kind of display what's happening. The pea is really, you have more launches of product from pea based. And then you see soy declining over time. But there is still a big gap. So it's still more soy in the market than pea. And if you think about that, it's because of some disadvantages. PDCAS, we talked about it at the beginning. So it has lower PDCAS than soy. It's about 0 0.8 to 0 0.85, depending on processing. Um, as of now, the functionality compared to soy is not great. It doesn't gel as much. I'll give you examples later in the other lecture. Um, it's not very soluble. It doesn't emulsify that well, but yet they are being incorporated in different applications, um, but they are lagging behind soy. Flavor, they still have the ingredients carry this beanie note, beanie flavor, legume kind of flavor. Soy has many years of research uh, ahead of pea in terms of uh, removal of the flavor components, yet pea still has ways to go. Um, and then another issue from a producer perspective, protein in pea is only 20%. So when they take out the protein, you have lots of starch and lots of fiber. What do you do with these byproducts? you know, as a producer, you don't want to waste anything. So we need to figure out, research needs to be done to figure out what do we do with, we already have potato starch, corn starch. What is pea starch unique for and how can it have its own market? So a little bit about production of the pea protein and any, actually any pulse protein that is high in starch. So pea and chickpea and lentils and beans are all starchy legumes. So they're high in starch and they have some protein and then they're high in fiber. So there are unique, uh, there's a unique technology to kind of concentrate the protein from the flour and we call that dry milling. So you can get the protein, the, the pea flour, and you put it in an air classifier. So it's basically uh, the, pea is the pea flour particles and components are separated based on density. So you get a fraction that is high in protein and of about 50 to 60, on average 55% protein. And you get a starchy fraction that is used for different uh, trying to be used in different applications. But if you want to concentrate the protein a little more and produce an isolate, we have to do something called wet milling. So with wet milling, basically you want to solubilize the protein out of the starch and fiber. So you have the flour and you want to solubilize the protein and separate it from starch and fiber. So if we look at that pH solubilization curve of uh, a legume, um, either soy or pea in this case, you see that it is highly soluble at alkaline, a little bit of alkaline, 7.5 to 
a 8.5, you can solubilize more of that protein. So you can do alkaline solubilization, and then you solubilize the protein and also some sugars and flavors and colors that are soluble. Now you want to purify the protein from the other soluble, including soluble fiber. Then you go, okay, I'm going to reduce the pH down to the isoelectric point. Then I can precipitate the protein and get rid of other solubles. Then I take that precipitate, I uh, make sure I neutralize it back to neutral pH, pasteurize, spray dry, and off you go. You have a protein ingredient of above 80% purity. You can also uh, solubilize the protein by salting in, and we'll talk a little bit about salting in later. But that means if you add a little bit of salt, you enhance water interaction with the protein because the, the salt interact a little bit loosely at the surface of the protein, adding some charge load, then the protein becomes a little bit more soluble. So you solubilize the protein and other solubles that come out as well, and you separate the insoluble starch and fiber. Now you want to isolate the protein even more, remove the solubles. There are two ways to do that. You can precipitate the protein by something called salting out. Add a lot of salt, mostly ammonium sulfate is added. And when you add a lot of salt, that protein precipitates uh, because the, now the salt is shielding charges on the protein, preventing the protein from interacting with water. And instead, the protein interact with each other by hydrophobic interactions and they precipitate up. Definitely then after that, you need to wash the salt out and a lot of water, a uh, lot of energy. So it's not really used in industry because of the high amount of salt that is needed. Alternatively, you can add membrane filtration. So when you solubilize the protein and you have small molecules that are still soluble, then you can do ultrafiltration and diafiltration where you can have a retentate that is high in protein and your salts and sugars and, and you can concentrate as well by removing some of the water uh, can pass through the membrane. And this preserves the protein and produce a little bit High, higher concentration of protein with some soluble fiber associated with it. Oil seeds. So um, oil seeds, like such as can canola, sunflower, canola, pennycress. So they're high in protein, high in oil, and high in fiber. Um, so first of all, you need it's different process than uh, the starchy legumes. Here you need to remove the oil. So potentially you press the oil out and then you would have residual oil in the cake that is pressed. Here's an example of a cake that is pressed and an oil. Um, then what you do, we normally to get all of the oil out, we do hexane extraction. And then you get the meal that is rich in protein and fiber. That particular meal, usually you do either pH extraction or salt extraction, the way we described earlier. But mostly what's happening right now is pH extraction. So as of now, no, they're not in the big eight, nine, 10 allergens, they're not listed. Uh, they have environmental benefits, some of them. They have comparable PDCAS, appreciable uh, PDCAS. Uh, for example, canola is very close to soy in terms of PDCAS. But the problem is, is a pressed cake like that, it's kind of your protein is entangled with the fiber. It's so hard to extract. And it is an alkaline protein. That means it really, really needs high pH to extract. Then with that, you end up having browning at high pH, polymerization of the protein, and also oxidation of polyphenols. They're high in polyphenols and glucosinolates, which are compounds that have the sharp uh, flavor, uh, mustard-like flavor. Um, but there are breeding going on to reduce the amount of polyphenols and glucosinolates. So there is a wild type have, having a high, type, high amount of glucosinolate. And by selective breeding, not genetic modification, they're able to reduce the amount of glucosinolate. So there's research going on now to 
basically make them more um, food friendly. Hemp, you must have heard now it is uh, approved uh, for uh, production and consumption. It does belong to the cannabis sativa species, but which includes marijuana, but it has very low um, levels of THC. So it is not, doesn't have a psychoactive effect. And it is the seeds, uh, not the leaves and the flowers, uh, which used to produce CBD oil. Uh, the seeds themselves are high in oil, not CBD, just oil and uh, protein and fiber. So they are uh, looked upon as another source of protein. If you find you can find some dehulled uh, hemp seed on the market, and when you remove the hull, then the fiber goes down, and percentage of fat goes close to fifty percent, and protein close to thirty percent. So it's pretty rich in these essential uh, components, and you can produce a flower of a dehulled um, seed and it's really white, very white, and you can use it to produce protein ingredient that is white, which is a very advantageous characteristic. Currently non-allergenic, and it is highly digestible protein. However, it's low in lysine. So there are breeding efforts to have uh, some new lines that are high in lysine to compensate. And functionality is not yet very well explored. We're doing research on it to see how functional this protein can be and what applications it can be used in. Single cell protein, I don't know if you ever heard of Perfect Day, for example. It's milk not from cows, from yeast. So the yeast got DNA from cow. So it's genetically modified and they produce casein and whey protein. And then the milk is formulated similar to the components of milk that are coming from the cow. So, I mean, it's great, but we don't know about consumer acceptability yet because of the fact that it is bioengineered. So other than that, we can produce proteins from bacteria, ye uh, fungal, and algae, uh, algae as well. Um, so advantages from just single cell uh, or mycoflora in general, it's alternative source. It can be very digestible. Uh, if you produce the proteins, they simulate exactly the proteins from dairy, so you get the same uh, characteristics, taste, and color. Um, low impact on the environment. But again, not much is known about them, what other components are being secreted from the yeast and end up in the product. What is its genetic engineering? What's the consumer acceptability? These are still remain questions. Um, algae is another source. It's easy to grow, takes less land, obviously, and space, and um, can survive harsh conditions. So the way to extract the protein can be a little bit challenging. We need to break the cell wall so that we can extract the protein. So we need to use additional processes, but potentially we can use alkaline extractions or membrane filtration once the cell material are broken that will help proteins to be extracted. Um, lots of advantages, like I said, uh, land use is low can be grown easily, has been used as source of food for humans, low allergenicity as of now, good source of essential amino acids. We don't know much about it, so we don't know how digestible this protein is, how functional. There's this, again, flavor issue, and processing cost might be high, especially if we need additional processing to extract that protein. Fungal protein, you must have heard of corn. So it is a multicellular uh, fungus, it's not a single cell. So basically filamentous fungus that is fermented uh, in um, chambers such as this, where you grow the fungus and then you give them food and then you collect the mycoprotein um, from another end. So um, that is very nutritious. It really has high, Pilicas, it mimics the meat texture, no allergenicity or low allergenicity, and there's no use of land. It's processed in plants, in 
the production plants that is. Um, it's bioengineered, again, a concept of eating fungus. Some people don't like that. And it's not extensively researched. That's among the uh, kind of the disadvantages. Insect proteins, of course, you hear a lot about them now. Um, they are, insects, of course, can be produced on much lower land, can utilize organic waste uh, to, for food, uh, can produce more protein per uh, number of uh, insects compared to cattle, for example. Um, and the proteins can be extracted from the powdered insect after defatting uh, using alkaline extraction mostly. So you end up having some uh, protein concentrates that go into some products such as here protein bar, for example. Um, you know, it's high quality protein. It's, you have wide varieties that can be used and grown organically, um, can be economically produced. However, the advantage, especially in Europe and North America, is the concept of eating insects. It, unlike in other parts of Asia, for example, where it's been in the culture for years, here there is some acceptance issues. Um, and reason, there's not a lot of research done. Where can we use them other than in a protein bar? How functional can they be? Or other than incorporate them in a muffin or a cake? I know a, a young ent entrepreneur person working on developing products with, with a cricket flour. But not a lot has been done with the functionality of that, of that protein uh, to understand that. And then the issue is also legal. Um, some countries don't allow insects in foods. Uh, for example, here in the US, we have FDA regulations for insect parts. If you remember in the analysis, the last lecture we talked about, we said 75 insect fragments in 50 grams of flour is defect action level. So above that is considered filth. So, so how do we incorporate the ingredients as part of food and, and while we're having this defect action levels stated by FDA? So it's, work still needs to be done in that area for labeling purposes and for incorporation in different food products. So there's a lot of alternative proteins, but there is still a lot of research to be done to understand how these proteins can be used, can replace different conventional proteins and still maintain nutrition, functionality, you get the texture and structure that you're looking for, and also flavor. I call these the three pillars. It has to taste good, it has to function in a particular application, and it has to give us nutritional uh, benefits so we can put on the label a high source of or an excellent source of. Otherwise, it's useless if it doesn't have nutritional uh, benefit. And if it doesn't taste good, nobody's going to eat it. If it doesn't emulsify, we can't put it in a product that needs emulsification and so on. So we really need to understand um, how to use these new alternative protein. And also, uh, how do we extract them from their matrix in a cost-effective manner while we maintain protein integrity, the structure, the function, the flavor, etc. What are the unique characteristics about them that we can potentially use them for very unique application? For example, mung bean, uh, but I think have just have a patent on that, the company just. It is specifically functions really well for egg replacement. So what are, what are the unique characteristics that makes them uh, important or great for a particular application? So this needs to be studied. Also, how do we breed uh, for functionality? So we can definitely look at diversity in, in crop lines and varieties and determine to see if we can breed for protein functionality, not just for yield or quantity. And of course, when we talk about new crops and alternative crops, we need to make sure that we have sustainable and abundant supply for big companies uh, that would require great amounts for them to uh, produce certain products, like big CPG companies, for example, like General Mills. So I think this ends 
my lecture and I think I am at, at 50 minutes. So uh, thank you all and I will stop here the recording and hopefully I'll have another one ready for you for the next topic. <laughs>